Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this is a video for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. This is for Chapter 3 of the textbook, Infancy, and this is Part 3, Cognitive Development in Infancy. Now, uh, there's a few things we want to look at here in particular. We talked about some of the uh, stages of sensory uh, motor development. And so this is from the work of Jean Piaget we mentioned in the in the first chapter. Uh, Piaget divided sensory motor into six general stages. He talked about simple reflexes, which are uh, inborn reflexes like grasping and visual tracking. He talked about primary circular reactions. That's the repetition of stimulating actions that first occur by chance, focus on the child's own body. We have secondary circular reactions, and those are patterns of activity that are repeated because of their effect on the environment. So, for instance, shaking an object to hear it rattle. Then there's coordination of secondary schemas, and that's where infants coordinate uh, uh, schemes to attain a specific goal. So, for instance, they might lift a cloth to see a toy when they saw it placed underwards, uh, under there. And then uh, tertiary circular responses. And then this is the infants enter what uh, Piaget called the little scientist stage, where they could be begin making purposeful adaptations of established schemes to specific situations. So trial and error begins as the infant explores the environment around them. And then we have the invention of new means through mental combinations. And this is a transition between the early sensory motor stages and the later stages of symbolic thought, which were the core of what Piaget was interested in. And these are characterized by forms of uh, mental exploration. Finally, one major accomplishment during the sensory motor uh, stage is the development of object permanence. And this is the recognition that an object or person continues to exist when out of sight. This is linked to the development of uh, infant working memory and reading ability. And it, again, it shows up in the exploration things when the child is actually uh, going to look under something to try to find something, because they have to know that it's still there. All right. Now, Let's talk a, a little bit about strengths and limitations of Piaget's theory of sensory motor development. Um, most researchers now agree that cognitive development is not quite as tied to discrete stages as Piaget suggested. Then again, almost any time somebody proposes a stage theory, it's going to get people will find the holes in it. Um, research has shown that interpersonal influences, which Piaget did not address, play significant roles in cognitive development. In fact, that owes more to Vygotsky, who we mentioned uh, briefly early on, uh, who talked about the zone of proximal development and being able to do things when in a social situation that you couldn't do on your own. Also, it looks like Piaget may have underestimated infants' competence in areas like object permanence and deferred imitation, and that they can show up uh, in much earlier in ways that were not expected. On the other hand, Piaget's contributions have been enormous in terms of especially uh, understanding, you know, the intellectual development of children. Uh, fortunately, a lot of work's been done since then to expand it. Okay, let's take a look at information processing, especially about uh, memory. Um, now, newborns demonstrate uh, mastery for stimuli that they've been exposed to previously. So, memory improves dramatically between uh, two and six months of age, and then again by 12 months, indicating that older infants have an increased capability for encoding and or retrieving information, um, especially, as this uh, picture shows, for recognizing the faces of familiar people. Here's another one here that's a, a baby monkey, not a person. But you'll see what's interesting here is about imitation. So imitation is the basis for a whole lot of human learning, and newborns can imitate adults who open their mouths and stick out their tongues within the first hour of birth, which is why this is a very common thing that people do. And this early imitation is enabled by the presence of what are called mirror neurons, or specialized neurons in the brain that facilitate the repetition of what other people are doing. Um, on the other, and then there's also what's called deferred imitation, because this first one is, is sort of immediate. Um, that is, imitation that occurs after a time delay, that can occur as early as six months of age. And what you see here in this uh, particular picture is that um, we got a guy who's holding a uh, a newborn rhesus monkey, so really little, sticking out his tongue. And then what's fascinating is that you see in the right-hand picture, the rhesus monkey is sticking his tongue right back out at the person. So um, all sorts of species, uh, well, humans are primates, and as are rhesus monkeys. And so we have the imitation here. Next, we want to talk about individual differences. And so you can see here that 
there's something called the Bailey Scales of Infant Development, and these assess both mental and motor abilities. So the mental scale assesses things like verbal communication, perceptual skills, learning and memory, and problem-solving skills. The motor scale assesses gross motor skills like walking and climbing, as well as fine motor skills uh, like the ability to manipulate fingers and hands. And that's a little bit what's going on right here. So you can see it's a way of assessing uh, the really the cognitive function in several dimensions of uh, early children. Next we have language, which is a huge area of research. Now, crying is the first form of verbal expression. Uh, then after that comes cooing. Um, so we see also that cooing and crying, they're innate, but they can be modified by experience. And then after that comes a babbling, in which consonants and vowels are combined. This leads eventually up to the first word around 11 to 13 months of age, and then at 18 to 22 months, there's a, there's a vocabulary explosion. Then you get, for instance, things called uh, holophrases as a single word used to express a complex idea. Um, and then you also get uh, telegraphic expressions in which only essential words are used. Now, it's also during this time that infancy as a stage is over because Infant literally means a lack of speech, or uh, more specifically, a lack of complex speech. And so by the time they're two, they're able to use some complex speech, and that uh, time of infancy is over. Also, as we see here, um, a lot of theorists talk about language development through imitation and reinforcement. So that's, that's behaviorism. So uh, the social cognitive perspective views parents as models which children observe and imitate. Um, so on the other hand, behaviorists such as B.F. Skinner, he explained the change, uh, the pattern and changing frequencies in terms of reinforcement of the sounds of adults' language and the extinction of the foreign sounds because the kids weren't reinforced. Uh, for doing them. And this perspective uh, claims that vocabulary is acquired primarily through shaping, uh, the parents requiring that the children's utterances be progressively closer to actual words before they're reinforced. Now, the nativist view, that so that, that's the behaviorists were ones who were saying it was learned. The nativist view claims that children have an inborn tendency, so to learn uh, the form of neurological pre-wiring for language learning. They, so they, they, they learn language more easily than other things, and that's something that's kind of built in. Uh, the behaviors generally didn't work very much with stuff that was built in. Um, the person best known for the nativist view of language is Noam Chomsky, and he called something the language acquisition device. It's a funny term. Um, but it's been supported by the universal nature of human language abilities. And that's where we're going to stop this section.